Karina and I work for your flock. Perfect timing. So uh, thank, a huge thank you for us, for, for everyone to be attending. We had lots of people uh, signing up for today's event and not surprising because of the quality and the caliber of our award-winning speakers from a variety of different companies. I, I know I always I get a bit excitable when I talk about these companies because I'm massive fans of all of them. So and I have been for many, many years. So I'm very, very lucky to have them all here today. So uh, a wave maker and a Padme, um, a can, of course, and of course, if agency as well, all, I think all members of the MPA, we were very lucky uh, your flock to be able to sponsor the MPA awards last, uh, last month. And uh, that was a great, a great night, to be fair, great night had by all. And um, it was, it, I, love, I love the fact we could do it because we're all about helping companies become better places to work. And of course, therefore, we sponsored the Best Place to Work Awards. I'm very happy to say that we have three or four people who were nominated for that today. Um, I also promised Mihail Wisniewski, who's my co-founder, that I'd do a quick and um, very bad introduction to your flock. So I'm going to do that now and hopefully it'll all work out. Um, but just a bit of a side note, I'm a bit poorly, so it will see, see if I can push the right buttons. So I'm hoping if I close slide share, Mihal, can you let me share my screen and can you see that? Let's have a quick slide share, Let's share the screen. Yeah, that should be fine. And can you see my screen? Just a quick thumbs up if everyone can see the big blue screen. Awesome, fantastic. Thanks very much, everybody. Right, okay, so you should know, or you could know what your flock does. And your flock uh, is a, a software as a service system, a SaaS product, uh, which is based on values. And it's also based on keeping your employees for longer. What your flock does is we flag people that need support. So team leaders or managers can take action and make sure you keep your team together. This happens at such a great rate for us that we can almost, no, we can definitely guarantee that you'll keep your employees for 25% or longer. And we've got some great case studies. I'm going to ping you across by email to, uh, at the end of this uh, event today. So how do we do that? Well, the way we can do that is by taking, well, first of all, we find out what the individual's core values are. Because we can find out their core values and their motivations, we can ask them certain questions and they can give feedback to their team leaders. And they do so and they get a report, something like this, something that's really, really simple for team leaders to use. And the reason why your flock exists is to actually save time for those team leaders so they can actually give more help. About 90% of uh, managers say they don't really have time to be managers properly. And that is a bit of a scary stat. And you know, as Christian knows, and the MPA know, and all the people that have companies uh, that are working in our sector know, time is really important, but also so is management and so are people. So that's what your flock's here to do. It's here to help, especially managers who don't necessarily consider it to be uh, one of their strong points. And that's actually the reason why I help Mikhail build this because it's not one of my strong points too. So I find these reports really interesting and really helpful. It will show you your employee happiness short score. It will show you how aligned you are with your values. And more importantly for me, it shows you examples of what you need to do next. So let's say, for example, Cassidy, really, uh, collaboration is really important to her. Therefore, I need to be offering her more support to do that. And of course, as I just talked about before, this is based on values. In fact, it's the only employee engagement server which is based on values, a bit of a world first. Always good for Manchester to get a nice world first in there. And this is what it is. This is Mihal's uh, particular personal profile. I won't go into it too much because it's his and not mine. Um, but it does show that he's highly aligned. So thank goodness for that as you work for your flock and you're the boss. Thank goodness you're highly aligned with the rest of the team. Um, we do this not only because it's our mission to help a million people be happier at work, because we do this because we know that culture is really important. And it saves people money. So we work with a variety of different places. One of them was uh, just, they've just actually become award winning themselves because of their culture, IMD solicitors. We saved about £100,000 because they used your flock. So if you're the boss of a company, or if you know a boss of a company, or if you know a team leader that might need some help, or yourself, you're an agency that you want to start using this kind of thing and technology to do so, have a look at what your flock does. Anyway. Back to the panel discussion, more importantly, because these people are going to tell you the practical stuff. We're going to have a discussion around the practicalities of how you become one of these best places to work. So I'm hoping if I click stop share, we should all now see those. Awesome. Fantastic. OK, right. Great. So as promised, I wouldn't do that for very long. Not only because I'm a terrible salesperson, but also because we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the cleverness of the panel in front of me. So I'm going to um, I'm going to go for I'm going to do the introductions, and I'm going to pick on a good friend of mine for a very long time. I'm going to let Christian James go first because uh, well, so often you let me go first, Christian. So I'm going to let you go first, Christian, to introduce yourself. I'm sure everybody knows who you are already, but if not, over to you, Christian. Um, well, I'm I'm sure they don't, but. Uh... 
Yeah, just as a, a quick snapshot, so I'm, I'm sitting here at the, the IF agency um, offices uh, where I'm a founder and, and MD. Uh, so we're a creative agency uh, and we, we do brand development work and brand activation across multi-channel uh, campaigns. Um, my other hat, as uh, has been mentioned, is as chair of the MPA. So um, sitting as, as uh, the chair with, with a, a, a talented board representing anyone who works with uh, or in media, digital and creative businesses across Greater Manchester. Uh, and as you can tell, I've been doing it for quite a long time. Um, I've been in Manchester for okay a few years abroad working, but for the best part of 30 years. So um, very much a, a proud Mancunian, if not by birth, certainly uh, by appropriation. Uh, really, really lovely to be here uh, um, with this panel and uh, and your guests today, Dan and Michael. Fantastic, thank you there, Christian. I'm gonna move on to, um, I'm gonna go for the person, well, the company that actually won the best place to work at the MPA award, because that seems to link together rather nicely. Uh, so I'm gonna go over to Laura. Laura, over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Herbert. I am the head of people at Apadme. Um, for those who don't know who we are, we are a digital solutions agency based in the heart of Salford Keys. Um, really excited to be here today and share our experiences. And therefore, ooh, I'm going to therefore next go for, I'm going to go for Emma, because you were also nominated as well from a wave maker as well at that same awards. Oh, and you also yeah. won an award as well. But that's, that's a different thing. That's, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. Uh, thanks, Dan. And, uh, thanks, everybody. Um, so I'm Emma Slater and I'm a managing director here at Wavemaker North. We are a media planning and buying agency. And um, I'm really, really interested to be part of this panel today because having worked I, I, last week, I celebrated my 26th anniversary um, at Wavemaker or Wavemaker in all its geysers. So I've never really changed companies in my career. I did work somewhere else before. I clearly started when I was 10 years old, yes. Um, but um, I've never really worked in another company, but what I've always found is that employee engagement, driving culture, and all of the things that we work hard on to do well here at Wave Baker has always been part of my role, no matter how the agency has changed over time. And I'm really proud at the moment and the basis of our um, not quite winning entry, hats off, Laura, um, was the fact that our recent employee engagement score was eight out of 10, which in the market we're in at the moment, we were really pretty darn proud of. So I'm um, really looking forward to having a chat about all of the things around this space at the moment. Love that. And I love the fact that Emma admitted the fact that she started working at an illegal age when she was 10. So that, that's an interesting moment for an employee. I mean, employee retention, absolutely right. Well, you make a fair play that long, but employing people at 10, I'm afraid, I have to say, no, that's a red flag. So I'm just going to have to <laughs> red flag that moment. Uh, of course, not all our agencies have been around for 27 years. And I'm not in any way saying that the age and experience, therefore, trumps the rest. However, I will say that uh, lots of agencies of a certain size are very well known and that for brings us brilliantly on to Ian to explain uh, himself and, and the company that we're sure we all have heard of who he works for. So yeah hi everyone I'm Ian Lenehan I'm head of talent acquisition at McCann Manchester we're about 400 people now the advertising and creative space so if you've seen the Kevin the Carrot adverts at the moment and Smith Toys Christmas advert that's that's some of our work uh, very fortunate to work with some insanely talented people. Prior to that, I'd sp I've been here about five years now. Prior to that, I've spent a number of years working in external recruitment for agencies across the Northwest. So I've been seen firsthand a number of uh, approaches to the different topics that we're going to talk about today. So very pleased to be here. Love that. Thank you very much, Ian. Back, thank you to all of our panel uh, for being here. Back, thanks to everyone for being here, because, of course, we know that this is a hot topic. And that's why we've had so many people sign up to get the recordings and to listen to our panellists today, because, of course, employee retention is one of the key challenges, isn't it, right now across the sector? And uh, it, uh, one of those kind of one of the strategies, of course, that agencies are employing more and more. And we also at your flock work for the legal side of things. And in the legal sector, they're paying people more and more and more money. It's one of their key levers for success, apparently, at the moment, is to pay people more. Um, I think, Mihail, we did the study on it. I think it was something like 15% they're paying them more at the moment in time. But they're different to marketing and creative agencies. Of course they are. 
is bizarrely from a value driven point of view they are very different um but we also know they are you know economically and commercially so i'm going to go with christian first on this one so how important do you think pay is uh, to retain great talent in this sector and i'm going to go for christian first because i know with your with your hat on with the mpa you have a much wider gamut for this as well as being a particular agency owner yeah, um, thank, thanks, Dan. I, I, uh, I do. I think, uh, you know, what my um, my experiences and, and, and opinions uh, today, uh, I think, are going to be dwarfed by what I'm going to learn from from the, the shared experience, uh, for sure. But I think, you know, it's, it's a really hot topic at the moment. Um, we uh, we know from MPA point of view, but also from here at, at, at IF, um, that there has been a, a huge pressure on um, on agencies uh, when it comes to um, salaries, uh, wage inflation. Uh, there's been a real uncertainty post pandemic uh, of of true worth. Uh, Brexit's had a, a, a an impact for, for sure on on, on the uh, volume of candidates in every market, and that's had an impact on on our market here in Greater Manchester. I think we have we have a unique. Uh, issue here in Greater Manchester, and we're kind of victims of our own success. Um, Manchester is drawing. Uh, oh, I've got an interesting slide in here now. Is that you? You just going on uh, in going into uh, into darkness there, Dan? That's fine. Sorry, uh, distracted easily as you can tell. So yeah, Greater Manchester is doing really really well. There are more agencies uh, opening up. There's been lots of mergers and acquisitions going on. That that creates a lot of discussion and um, an attraction for people to 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 move around. And as they move around, um, they're not looking quite. More often, people are looking for less, uh, looking for more in their salary packet than less. And the but the interesting thing for me is when I talk to the the agencies that I admire the most, um, they always come back with a far broader discussion than than salary. It's never just salary, and uh, they've the ability to talk to their team as individuals and understand the motivations of those individuals and listen as much as talk uh, to understand what it is that's going to make that individual happy, uh, what support are they looking for, and yes, what are they looking for from a uh, you know obvious things to say in terms of the current economy and the cost of living crisis. We've got to we've got to take that into account. But what I find is that the the, the agencies that are doing well in terms of um, retention are generally the agencies that are doing well, full stop. And they aren't just having a binary discussion about how much do you want. You, you cannot, in our industry, I don't know about other industries, you cannot buy people, uh, buy people's loyalty. What you can is you can buy people for a certain amount of time and you'll soon find yourself looking for somebody else. So it has to be about more than salary, and I I, I tend to 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 find that um, with the successful agencies, it's always about something more than salary. You know, these days at the moment, people are looking for somewhere to 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 live. They might be, you know, an individual might be looking for a a new apartment, and actually getting them the ability, putting them in a position where they can do that, might mean a little bit less salary and a little bit more bonus. Um, it might be beyond that. It might be the fact that there's a certain particular need they've got in the health and fitness area. So it, 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 say, I could go on into the detail and lose myself here. But I think that the, the top and bottom of it is that the successful agencies right now are the agencies that don't talk to a, a, um, all of their team about just salary. It's an individual process to understand the needs of the individual and be able to satisfy those um uh on a one-to-one -one basis I, I, I love that because obviously your flock itself is based on team dynamics and individual values so the idea of feedback from individuals and listening to individuals is key I, I have a feeling that very few of our panel will argue against it but i'm really interested to hear what emma has to say about this around especially around the pay increase moment and uh, and what and what your thoughts are on uh, what else we can begin doing yeah, I think it's really, I don't disagree with anything that, that Christian says, that the challenges that I see, um, particularly at a junior level, are things that, that most concern me. And I think that people who've maybe heard me talk um, either at the MPA or at other events, I always talk about understanding the privilege that we have in our industry, that we are incredibly privileged as people and, you know, we're lucky to work in this business. 
But that doesn't take you away from the fact if you're working um, as an exec somewhere and somebody comes in and and you're earning more than a UK average salary and somebody comes in and offers you a few grand more to go somewhere else, it doesn't mean to say that you you turn away from that offer. I think the the um, salary is a very blunt tool, as Christian is is saying, and I think that what um, what I am seeing is people going into new roles or promoted roles for higher salary, um, which could potentially be beyond their ability. And that for me is one of the most worrying trends that salary is being associated with roles that maybe people aren't ready for. And, you know, I've certainly experienced that over, over a period of time. And I think that in a in a talent crisis, which certainly on the media side of the business we we've been in, um, the ability just to, you know, throw money at people is creating a further talent crisis, but in a different way for the future. We're just kind of stacking things up, and I think that sometimes as leaders in our business, we need to understand the responsibility we have for the personal development of juniors in the business and get them to be in a position where it isn't always about salary. And I remember speaking at an event, God, it may be maybe six years ago, eight years ago, something like that. And I just, you know, my voice to people is always, you know, a couple of thousand pounds now might feel like it's really big, but that's not going to make the difference to your career. And I think that we, when we're talking and we're enriching people in our organizations, part of our responsibility is to talk about development and growth, as Christian says, alongside that. And But also be really clear, open and honest about salary progression and what that looks like in the business. And then people can have better ways of making decisions. But I, my personal opinion is where we're at now is all we're doing is stacking up different problems that we can be on a panel about in three or four years time talking about because we're in a different situ in a different situation. Yeah, we'll be we'll be talking about finance and uh, and how how do we make these things now profitable now we've done the rest. I think Laura's either either was just saying kind of definitely a yes 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 or she was going let me go next. I'm not very emotionally intelligent, but I'm, I'm guessing Laura was going to go next. Laura, over to you. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for my uh, recognizing my signal. I think you have some great points there. I think from um, my experience of working in public sector, large enterprise, and now an agency. LinkedIn recently um, announced the Talent Insights and salary is the number one discussion point for candidates across the world, not just in the UK. And I think it's about us in um, in positions of authority in, in agency businesses, understanding that, you know, they are our customers at the end of the day. You know, candidates are customers and we are and we are marketeers to try and sell them the dream to, to come and work for us. So the candidates are telling us salary is really important to us you know we're getting squeezed by the economy there's cost of living crisis and I think also people have cottoned on that you know they have had wage stagnation for a number of years and you know you can see all the strikes etc so it's a bit of the zeitgeist as well so I think it's important that we recognize the trends in the industry at the moment cash is king for a lot of people and um, particularly our employees and I think also from running um, talent acquisition functions for the, the last 15 years um we have to do better in talent acquisition and I'm sure Ian can, can support this as well we 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 need to pay people their worth we we sometimes have a culture in in business of celebrating lowballing candidates it's just not acceptable acceptable anymore people will cotton on they will move on it is still a very much candidate driven market as well so we we see it as you know we have if we pay people their worth we have more engaged people we have happier people we have more productive people and the value adds the bottom line of the business is phenomenal from that as well we're not perfect yet academy we're still on our journey so I'm not I'm not here preaching from 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 my perch but for me you know we have a responsibility as leaders in this industry to really change the culture around discussion on salary being open and honest about it advertising salary brackets is an aspiration on job descriptions a great company that does this is, is sky betting and gaming for anyone who's interested so um so yeah i think around listening to our people understanding their motivations and and ensuring that we we pay people their worth is, is a really important um factor I love, love all that. And I love the uh, the aspiration of getting to the that a rather sticky point, which uh, at your flock, we have to be very agnostic when it comes to this whole, uh, you know, the wage moment, but also the the uh, the fact that you could maybe put wages 
on the on the on the uh, our job applications. I, I personally believe that it should be a legal requirement, and I get booed off stage. So I'm not going to say it, except I just did. Um, <laughs> but then handing that slightly uh, live, live grenade to Ian, and Ian, please answer the first question, not my rambling of the second point. Uh, but I knew that Ian would have a tremendous well, 15, 20 years of experience in talent acquisition. So I'll, I'll hand that over to you. What have you seen over the last? I'm not, I'm not going to say decade, but I've just said decade. So I'm now I'm already could tell myself. Um, so how, does, how are you seeing over the last decade as well as over the last five years? Yeah, I think it's a balance. Let's be honest, at the moment, it's higher on people's radar. I'm sat here now thinking I'm in a world of trouble off Mrs. L for having the radiator on when she gets home. We've, we've, all, got a, we've all got higher bills. But I think it is only one answer to retention at the end of the day. I think everybody's push and pull factors are different. The most important things I think employers need to think about salary, but they need to have a more holistic, I guess, answer to what they're offering their employees. Um, at McCann, that's about work culture. It's about benefits. It's about our focus on things like mental health and well-being as much as it's on salary. So I think you've got to have a place where people feel rewarded, feel that they've got the opportunities to progress and develop, and that ultimately they're being supported and recognised. But I think investment in lots of other areas is just as key. We've put a lot into, as I say, mental health and well-being with updated policies on gender transitioning at work and menopause we've been championing this year. Things like Parent Cloud to support parents, Headspace up for our people and groups like our True Pride Alliance for, for the LGBTQ community. Because we want to create a culture where people could feel they can be themselves at work. And I think that goes a long way and means a lot to a lot of people. I think benefits is a, another key thing and flexibility. I'm sure we'll we'll probably talk about a lot during today with, with hybrid working, et cetera. Being able to accommodate people's lives and give them that work-life balance is, is critical. Having well-adapted benefits that suit different groups. So again, we brought in a new flexible holiday system this year to give people more time off for days that matter, like charity days, school sports days, whatever they might be. So I think... You've got to have that holistic offering for people, not just about salary. Yes, we're undertaking a big exercise to review salaries and we're, we're looking at them, particularly at those on lower incomes. But I do think for me, it's just one part of it. If you don't value people and don't offer them the scope of recognition and everything else I've talked about, I think you can have a bigger challenge. No, you know, and also, uh, when you get past a certain point, certainly a certain seniority, that there is uh, some very well-placed evidence that say actually money becomes less of a factor. And again, that's worth Googling and, and working out for ourselves. But it's, again, it's one of these, I mean, from a psychological and uh, just a solicitor, just a, from, a, from a social point of view, rather from a your flock point of view, I find it really fascinating that that, you know, when you go past a certain Maslow's hierarchy of needs moment, it's suddenly not about money. And if, and if, and if life was purely about money and it was purely about money, then life would be so much easier. And wouldn't management be so much easier? Wouldn't everything be just so much easier if all it was was accruing cash and spending money on stuff? Uh, but of course, we're all human beings and uh, we know that, that is not always the case. But as you said, people, uh, especially if they're, I think Emma was talking about as well, but younger people and government coming in and also lower income, that, of course, does become a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs moment. Um, I'm not going to do the aside that Maslow actually stole that from someone, but that's that's a different point. That's a very, very different point. But it actually does lead into uh, examples of what uh, companies can do, of course. Have had me winning that award the other month would be that Laura would be not only in a fantastic position to talk about it, but she could literally list all the different things that have me do that have a positive impact on improving their own employee retention. So I'm going to throw the ball without Maslow's hierarchy of needs in it uh, over to Laura. Thank you very much, Dan. Um... So yes, yeah, so as I mentioned in my intro, I joined Padme 12 months ago and they've invested heavily in, the, in their people agenda. So we actually have a team of eight um, for a scale up of just, just over 200. So phenomenal in terms of ratio there. We've got experts in recruitment, um, HR and, and, and learning and development as well. And we've designed a very simple people plan that looks to attract, train and retain great people. Um, and the team are working really hard around that. It goes back to what you were saying, Dan, earlier on about understanding the motivations of our people um, we have an average age of 35 which I'd imagine is quite you know the same with most agencies uh, quite a young demographic but a variety of generations as well all looking for different things as well so it's all really goes back to understanding the customer so that customer centricity is really key to us so we've had 
um, a renewal on our engagement strategy. So we, we survey our colleagues every quarter. Um, we ask them a variety of simple questions. Our latest one closed last week, which 95% of our colleagues are proud to work at Apadme, which is the highest ever we've had. Um, we've reduced attrition by 20% year on year, uh, year to date. Um, we have a 4.6 out of 5 glass door rating with 85% of those ratings, four or five star above. And when we come to retention and retaining our colleagues, for us, it's about having, um, you think, as, as Ian mentioned, a variety of different techniques as well. But all of our aspects fall into those three buckets of, you know, great attraction, train. We want to be famous for how we train our people and, and retention tools in place as well. Um, for us, communication is key. So we have a town hall um, every week for all our colleagues and all hands every Monday, 4 p.m., hosted by our leaders where we share financial data, who big wins, big losses, that type of thing. We celebrate successes. We celebrate birthdays and occasions. It takes 20 minutes. And I'd say about 80, 85% of our business attend that. And we all have fun together. Um, we're very open and honest and transparent where the business is. Um, we have quarterly updates where we celebrate again together. One of the things for us as well, we've noticed one of the bigger battlegrounds in light of the salary challenges is, is L&D. So the conversation, particularly for our demographic that we are targeting, is how are you going to help grow my 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 career? How are you going to help grow my life and help me as a, as a human being? So we've invested in our Apadme Academy, which is a um, bespoke training academy um, where we look to inspire the future generations to join Apadme. We actually have launched a bespoke training centre in our HQ. So we have our entire first floor dedicated to our academy. Um, We've recently just had a learning festival, um, a week long activities. Uh, we had um, the great Apadme pitch off, a bit of a rip off from Dragon's Den last night, which was great. Um, but we're also designing clear progression pathways. So we have progression frameworks in place to say, these are the skills and the techniques that you need to know to develop your career. And then here's the training aligned to that as well. So. We're no means perfect, but we are looking at that holistic view of what really motivates our people. How can we speak to that? We're seeing some great results just a year in, in that as well. Um, things like we've just upda updated our maternity leave uh, to 25 weeks full pay so we can encourage more women to stay in, in the tech agency side of, of, of the business. So we are very open and honest with our people about how can we make your experience better? And be honest with us about that, because if you don't tell us, we can't solve for it as well. I, I love that. And everyone who's holding, I love that. Everyone's, I can see people just nodding. Just going up to, yes, okay. I just, that's a lot of good stuff there. See, that's, that's the ticket price itself, isn't it? That's, you should have at least eight things you should have written down, by the way. If you're not taking notes, then, of course, you can always watch the recording. Ah, of course, that's why we record things too. Ah, there we go. Um, but I also know that uh, I know that Christian from a different side of it will also have a slightly smaller agency point of view. But I'm going to I'm going to go over with Emma uh, to keep this ball rolling, if that's OK, Emma. Uh, and just are there some other things that, that you can think of that, uh, that Wavemaker have been doing? Because I think Wavemaker are a little bit older than a pad in, in the age of the business. Uh, but that doesn't doesn't mean that you know, you, old dog, new trick, etc. But more importantly, I'm sure there's other things that Wavemaker are doing that perhaps a pad me are not. I'll over to yeah. You. Yeah, um, we do a lot of things very similar to what um, what Laura's talking about there. And for me, the thing, the, the word that, that really screams out, the thing that I always go by is communication. And I think that the, the more that you can actually share and give your teams and tell your teams, then the more that they engage, that they become. And I think as, as well, it's about working with your teams to understand what they want you know I'm a 52 year old woman who's been at the same business for 26 years and um, I can't dictate just in the same way I I have to think about when I'm doing a media plan for a 27 year old single single girl in their first job or whatever I have to think about it from a different angle so I think always actually communicating with people and asking people what are the things that they want to do rather than um, having a forced fun situation that only comes from my angle I think what we've noticed which is interesting in the media business and for those of you who are on the call from um from media industries, I can see see a few names that I, I recognize. You know that alcohol has played a huge part in um, media and the entertainment of media. I can see Andy nodding there. Yes, it's uh, it's um, it's you know alcohol has been really important part of 
our business and in, and I don't say that with any sort of, of jest it's ha- it, it's what the way our business has worked for you know since the Mad Men days um, and I think that um, what we have recognized over the past few years is that's not necessarily what people want anymore and um, people younger people in the business want something different so really stepping out of yourself as a as a leader who potentially is of a different de- generation a different cultural background a different social background stepping out of yourself and really understanding what what your teams need is absolutely the most important thing and and talking to them we've just done a whole set of workshops on um, on cost of living with people and sort of asking people what we as Wavemaker both here in the Manchester office and in our London office what we can do to help people that isn't about isn't about salary isn't about bonuses it's about other things you know what you know the easy answer to that is pay me more money you know that's almost not always possible what are the other things that we can be doing as a as a business so tomorrow for example um here in the Manchester office and in the London office we've got our um payday lunch so we're going to do the day before payday we're going to give everybody a nice lunch and they picked what I would just automatically order pizza somebody says pizza's too unhealthy Emma I'm sick of pizza so we ask what people want so we've we've gone and got salads and things that's because that's what people wanted so communication and listening and you know if you think about what leadership is that's what leadership is it's communication and listening it's 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 really very little else (laughs) amen amen to that and of course uh proved what a terrible leader I was there by interrupting I think I did I I hope you finished the sentence I I presumed that you you had but it's a presumption of mine I should have listened more I definitely listened to the pizza thing because um yeah I I, (laughs) isn't it a classic especially in tech it's the pizza and beer thing and we've been doing it for 20 years and I'm still amazed how people are still doing it because I've given everyone gives quite a bit of feedback on that and every time oh no we'll do something different next time no they don't no it's always pizza and beer it's always pizza and beer and they've got to learn of course that they don't do that anymore and it doesn't help and that that kind of culture of uh, we're creating a kind of drinking culture without realizing it I think that sometimes what happens is that we do we do things when we're unconscious we think we're doing it for you know for the good of the people and we're being nice about it and creating a positive culture but of course things like bean bags and you know and, and drinking after work and all these things actually sometimes create the opposite it was only when uh, I really started thinking about it that I realised how bad beanbags really were. If you think about it from a not only just from an age point of view, from a, from a woman's point of view, crying out loud if you're wearing a skirt. Even those, by the way, it's a quick one. This one, even the, the, the you know the stools that we were forced to sit on when we do talks with people. Can we all stop that for a bit? Because those stools aren't great for women who are sitting on them either, and they're not they're not great for me either. But they, I just just not thought I mentioned that. Anyway, that's a nice aside. Um, Christian, I'm going to go over to you on this one, if that's okay. What other things can you do from a kind of a smaller agency point of view uh, that we that you can think of that you are doing? I know that Padma's listed at least eight there that I wrote down and I have a think about. I think there's three from Emma, but over to you, Christian. I I, I'm, I'm not sure this is this is anything to do with small size of business. Uh, what I'm going to say here, the uh, um, <clears throat> as an agency, we 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 often get told that we punch above our weight and that. You know, we, we, we are a small agency that thinks big because the, we have lots of well-known clients and um, it, 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 we've never felt that there's a compromise uh, to being here. I, I agree with, I, I hear what has been said already and, and some, you know, great stuff there. So I, I don't want to add sort of to a long, long list there, but I, I would say there's, there's something slightly different about where our start point and our start point I'm not uh, and it's definitely not new, unique here but the attraction of working I, I, I hope that the attraction of working here um, and for most people is it starts with the work it, it starts with what actually am I going to be doing not not what you can give me on top of that and, and around it those are all if I'm interested you know I, I meet somebody I like them I want to go out with them Okay, I might then go away and start thinking of the rational, where do they live? How old are they? You know, all those kind of, what previous convictions have they got? Um, and what am I happy to accept? Um, but, but really it's like, well, well, well who are they? And, and am I going to enjoy spending my time with them? And, and what, what am I going to be doing? So, you know, my, my first discussion with anybody uh, Coming, coming here in terms of attraction or in terms of retention is what are you going to be doing? Uh, what do we see you being able to do? And then together, let's work out where you can get to. And, and it's it's the work. It's people want 
certainly the people who succeed here are people who want responsibility, who people who have a combination of ambition and, and integrity and, and, and obviously, you know, creativity. Uh, but they have to be they have to be good people um, and to, to steal a, uh, an oft used uh, phrase, you know, better people make a better agency. And so, you know, we, we, we want to start with, with, the, with the, the people, with the job that they're going to be doing. And then and then as we sort of will come back to as we sort of started the conversation today, what are the things around that that are going to help to make this happy? for you and they you know last couple of years ago somebody loves cycling from the city center down the canal so we got a an electric bike through the work to you know bike bikes work for work scheme and um you know, it, it can be anything and everything and I, I i would just i'd finish my little segue by just echoing what emma said there it, it's it's about listening it's about communication the the, the huddles that we have here uh we do one every Tuesday afternoon, which I lead, but it's often, you know, me just introducing and con contributions come from across the team to make sure that we're in the busy lives that we, we, we work in. Nobody feels like they're stuck in their lane, that it's a, it is a team effort. Everybody's got their responsibilities, but we, 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 we tell everything, um, you know, good and bad, good news, bad news. Um, we, we share that information um, readily. Uh, and I have to say that's probably only in the last five years that we've been so dedicated to making sure that meeting takes place, whether it's virtual or we try and do it physically now and everybody, everybody's in, everybody comes in for that. And that's a, a signal to me of how important that communication, uh, that communication is. And I love the idea of communication, of course, and feedback being key. And of course, that's what your flock actually helps with is getting that feedback from people. And I'll just also give the panel a little bit of a thing here. I've been a really bad at keeping time because I've been so interested in listening to all the things you're saying. We would normally now be going into the negative side of things, but actually I'm going to get rid of that because I think we could keep going with the happy side of it. I think we all know the negative side of bad practice out there. And let's not let's not dwell on that. Let's go for much more fun stuff that we can look at. So so I'm going to go to Laura on this one. I'm just going to talk about uh, individuals at work and then I'm going to go to Ian after this but we're talking about uh, people becoming more happier feeling better at work and also becoming more productive so what are your thoughts uh, not just from a pandemic but in life itself uh, that you can uh, you can give us about employees becoming happier and therefore more productive yeah I think it's just reiterating quite a lot of what's been said it is all about understanding the motivations and values of the individual and making sure that as a business we're aligned to that I think um, it is creating an open culture is and it is all understanding the motivations of, of those individuals as well um, I think it's also um, having a robust recruitment process I think it's really important that you know one thing that sometimes we don't recognize we focus sometimes on bums on seats and, and filling a vacancy that actually it has to be the right people who are aligned to your values your brand and your goals as an organization so we are very meticulous in who we let in the door at Padme um, because we want to continue creating this amazing community feel and, and culture that enables people to thrive and grow um, we ask people to take ownership for their own growth and development as well, and we give them the tools and platform to do that through LinkedIn Learning, Access, and, and Udemy, for example. So for me, it's all about values alignment. I think, you know, as we've known over the last few years, last life is too short to be unhappy in your in your job. You spend a lot of time there. And it's important that we live up to the commitments that we've given to people um, and, and they live up to their commitments that they've given to us about being productive and, and having an impact. So um, having the right people in the right roles in your business is critical to that. Well, I love the idea. I just love the idea of that because it's absolutely true. I think there was a, a stat that came out a few years ago about if you're if your personal values align with your uh, employer, then you're something like four or five times more productive at work, which seems insane. But if you actually look at the other stats around engagement, there is a horror stat that there's about 85% of people are not engaged at work. Um, you know, only about 15% of people are truly highly engaged in the work in the workplace. So again, that is, uh, I always think that's shocking for, for leaders, especially your larger businesses, that they've got, they're carrying quite a few people. And of course, you know, this is one of the challenges, isn't it? You know, getting the right people is great, but you know, people change and therefore you've got to be open to feedback and open to communication and be listening all the time. And with that, I'm going to listen to what Ian has to say around this idea of uh, becoming happier and, and more productive. So I know you've got a few personal things that you want to talk about this uh, now as well. 
Um, I think it's it's all about creating a space where people can feel comfortable taking their personal challenges inside and outside of work, talking about them and knowing it will be accepted and supported. I mean, I personally, I won't go into detail, but I've, I've had a challenge in 12 months outside of work. But what helps is knowing the support I'll get from our CEO, from our HR director. I can talk openly about what's on my mind, what's coming up. And work becomes almost a positive distraction rather than an additional headache. And I think we... We have a tendency sometimes in this industry to value certain traits and one I always see is resilience. Well, actually, I don't think it is about that. I think what we should be looking for is empathetic leadership. People shouldn't have to be personally resilient. We should have a workspace where they can bring themselves to work and accept that not everything's going to be rosy every day. Um, I think it's also important the leadership is seen to embody the message and values of the agency. I think that transparency, again, and communication that's been talked about is key. We're all about creating inclusive work culture and having an emphasis on the promotion of mental well-being. It's, it's a very core principle for us. But we see our leadership actively engaging in that and actually leading by example. Our CEO, Karen, was recently named an inclusivity game changer by campaign. And it's, it's because we're actually trying to practice what we preach. And I think having leadership that are actively out there, as I say, implementing what they say makes a big difference to then how people can... Can, be, can can feel when they're in the workplace. I was just nodding so much that I forgot that I had to then unplug, unmute myself. I only say that, but it is that, isn't it? It's about uh, this new, potentially new type of leadership, uh, which seems to be uh, almost the opposite of what Elon Musk is doing at this moment in time. Uh, I, I love Elon Musk. He's just the gift that just keeps on giving, isn't he, from a CEO point of view? Certainly from somebody who works in my position. I get, he's literally, he's, put, he's, he's actually paid for my holiday. That's how much I've gone on the media talking about how bad his stuff is. I mean, obviously the richest man in the world isn't going to care about that. And let's see what he does on Twitter. He could well have turned it all around and uh, he could be absolutely right. I really hope he's not because if he is, then it's going to be a horrific time in tech because everyone's going to say, well, oh, Elon Musk did it and therefore it must be good. And that, that just scares the heck out of me. I have a feeling here, if we did his Your Flop test, caring would not be top. That's a guess. And uh, I imagine he might not be empathetic or he might be all those things. And I've just read his tweets and just presumed he's awful, <laughs> which is a very different thing. Sorry, personal, personal joke there. But it also links into the, the question I've got for Christian, which is around character traits. So what character traits are often sought after in marketing world, but then can hinder our potential progression and happiness? And I know that you had some thoughts on that. And I'm going to come to Emma after you, if that's OK, Emma. So, uh, Christian. Yeah, I, 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 I want to listen to Emma, so I'm going to keep this really brief. <laughs> um, brilliant. I love I, that. I just, I love I, I, there, there were a few thoughts, but I think one, one that always comes up, and I'm, I, I'm conscious I mentioned it earlier, ambition. Um, ambition is a, is a really, you know, it's a, it's a trait that's, that's often in the job description. It's often in the first discussions that you have when you're doing chemistry meetings um, and you talk to your clients about it and they expect it from, from you. Um, but, but I, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 an issue that arises when there's so much emphasis on the word without explanation about what's expected from, from you. Um, it can create a culture of restlessness that you should never be satisfied, that you, you, there is, a, you know, a, a constant pursuit of perfection and, if, and anything less is disappointment. So I think, I think we, we, we use words like ambition. Um, I, I think, Ian, absolutely, that's, that, just, that really resonated, the, the comment around resilience. And, um, I, I, and I, I, I love the, 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 the counter to that. I think I'll, I'll definitely be borrowing, borrowing that and, and sharing that with the team here. Um, but ambition for me is one of the ones which is, 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 a, is a platitude. It's, it's, it's said without an understanding of, uh, or, 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 an, or an explanation given. You're just told, we expect you to be ambitious. Okay, what does that actually look like? What are you expecting from me? And does that fit with how I see the world? And you'll find inevitably people will have different versions of that. So find as a lead in, but don't just leave it as, as that cold, stark word, because it can set an expectation and a, and a culture of restlessness. And ambitious people, if they're constantly told they need to achieve more, that's kind of an invitation to go and ask them to go and seek it somewhere else. I, think that's I, don't, I don't think it's in anyone's interest to be using these words so flatly, you know, and coldly. It has to be explained. Everybody needs to be clear 
what 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 it means and inevitably it will mean different things to different people and of course then you have the what are the behaviors that come from that so you know there's a it always makes me smile that um that's so why i think there's a massive difference between brand values and individual real values which is why we do your flock is not based on brand values it's based on nine principles of these values now the reason why i mentioned that is integrity in the banking industry 55 percent of banks have integrity as one of their brand values, 55% of them. It'd be interesting to know how many actually follow those as behaviours. I don't know if you've noticed the market at the moment, um, but there you go. I mean, my point being is we all say integrity is important, don't we? But actually, are, you, are we doing the behaviours that mean integrity is important? And are we really showing it? How do we show our values? Um, I'm going to hand over now to Emma on it, only because I thought that filler that I just did may have given you enough time to bring in your things. And by the way, Christian, if that was not a great answer, I'd like to know what a great answer would have been what you would have given but there you go that was a great answer Amber, i know i'm feeling i'm feeling a bit of a follow that i wouldn't disagree with anything christian said i'm just going to talk about it from a slightly different angle because i think there's things that are important um a really important part of our our business um but actually people are a little bit afraid of displaying which i think it creates a different kind of tension in in how we behave in business and what we get from business and whilst I talk about we need people who are really interested we need people who are curious we need people who are constantly seeking something to be better than it was before all of those kind of baseline behaviors the thing that I always want people to be is authentic and I think authenticity is something that just um it's so underrated but it's so scary for people you know a lot of us have said today on the on the panel about being able to bring your whole self to work and we talk about a lot that now be the person that you are be the person that you you know you are comfortable with be who you want to be and you should be able to do that as much in your work environment as you can in your home environment but I feel that in your social environment but I feel that authenticity is not only sometimes not welcome but also sometimes really underrated as something that will really move our 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 business forward and um, when I was a working in London I went into my line manager's office I was expecting to be promoted um, my line manager actually thought I was a level below what I was so was saying he was thinking about promoting me to the level that I actually was and then I said no I'm, I'm actually that level I was expecting to be promoted to the, the senior level in planning um and he turned around to me um this was in the early 90s he turned around to me and he said I'm sorry Emma um you'll never be um a senior planner here because you don't wear enough makeup and you've got too much of a northern accent now from that moment on that's when I realized that maybe London wasn't the place for me um and I made the uh, the 26 year ago move back up to up to the north of England but for me it was a it's something that I've never forgotten and it was a really defining moment in the career because my visceral reaction to that was that means that you're telling me I can't be who I want to be at work I can't be the person I can't be my authentic self and and recently um Lisa Thompson who won the Martin Hett award at the MPA awards um she actually wrote wrote in her her paper for that uh, something that again really resonates with me but gives me this massive sense of responsibility about continuing to be authentic and that was you can't be what you can't see and for her point of view when she came into the business seeing um, a northern woman with a northern accent in a leadership position meant for her coming from a, a working class Wakefield background meant that she could be me she could be a senior person in our in our industry. So I think authenticity is really important because whoever the whole you is, and I think we ought to embrace it and not let it hinder our progression and hinder people's careers. Because if you can embrace who you are, you are inspiring somebody else out there who's similar to you, who wants a pathway and wants to do something and wants to be a leader, wants to be a senior person in the business, wants to go in this, that, the other direction. But being the authentic you means that they can see that and then there'll be somebody out there for everybody in our business. We'll grow our business, we'll grow our diversity, and we'll grow the people who want to be part of this wonderful marketing, media, tech community that we that we have in Manchester. So for me, it's about authenticity. And I just wish people felt that we could embrace authenticity a, a lot more than we than we do. I suppose that I mean, but only is that arousing, you're absolutely right, with all <laughs> of that things as well, with diversity, inclusion, everything else. I mean, this is, I think it's an, almost a separate podcast about how can you bring your authentic self to work in the marketing and creative uh, industry so Michal uh, let's let's have a think about that for maybe February next year but uh, <laughs> and 
by Emma back as well, by the way, just a quick one. Uh, so, so we could talk about that for a bit. I mean, I, I knew that I had it on my on my list also, Ian, the same question, but it's, it's over to Ian if you'd like to answer that authenticity at work. I think the authenticity at work, as you say, I mean, it's such a huge, huge topic. I think there's a lot to say there. I think what's resonated a bit with what Emma and Christian said there is some of those key sort of traits that commonly come up and authenticity is something we don't measure enough. I think as an industry, we... There's two things I see on an almost daily basis when I'm looking at job adverts online of, of who's looking for what. And we still talk about needing people who can work at a fast pace. Who, who, who's measuring fast pace? Are we really saying somebody who's more methodical and thought out can't be a really capable account manager? But the other one I always see is confidence. And I, and, and I think we have a, a challenge sometimes in this industry. I think we sometimes confuse confidence with capability because they'll say more in a meeting. And actually the quietest people in a meeting are often the people with the best ideas. It's coming back to the idea of the authentic self, which key is we to create a culture where those people feel capable of being able to speak up in meetings and not be over-talked by not always the most capable person in the room. Not yourself, Tom. <laughs> the, the, the irony is, of course, I didn't dare unmute myself at that moment because that definitely would have been me. I would have been like, oh, God, now, now I'm doing exactly what... I'm the person without the talent who then has to then say something. Damn it, that is definitely me. I'm not very much an introvert in that respect. But I think, you know, it is... Um, it's a really, really important point that you make there, especially around some of those words that we use or, or the industry uses of the kind of traits that they want to get. I think that's a really key one. And then there's another one as well. I'm sure we don't use it anymore, but when people put, uh, we're like a family in, in their job adverts. I mean, they just, I know we're all now laughing about it, but we used to, didn't we? It's like a family here. It really shouldn't be, by the way. If your agency is a bit like, you've got to be really careful with that. And that's, I'm not going to touch that with the barge ball because uh, I'll, I'll rant and I promise myself I wouldn't. But we're also talking about ideas and the quiet people who have been quiet for too long are people like Laura, because I've been rambling with my filler to the next question. And I've only given you a few minutes, which is insane because it could be a thing by itself, but I know that a Padme are in this place of hybrid work and remote working and hybrid work. I'm sure we all are, but I know you've done some brilliant stuff about how you make sure employees don't feel separated or excluded. And that's only because I've been talking to a few people inside of Padme who I've known for many, many years about this. So they've already been applauding what, you, what you've been up to, what you folk have been doing. So if you could give us a few of those things in the next couple of minutes, that would be great. This is about making sure that you don't have a, a separate or excluded remote and hybrid culture forming in such a large agency. Yeah, um, great. So I think because of uh, the post-pandemic post era, we were very honest about giving people choice. So we were very much around you work in the flexible root areas that you want to, that suits your lifestyle, but makes you the most productive that you can be. We've actually seen quite a big flock back to the office because people have been able to have that choice. So we've moved away from insisting that people come in two, three days a week. And these set days, we, we've enabled people to be adults and make that decision so you know Tuesdays Thursdays are naturally more the, the, the busier days um, so we still have quite a lot of hybrid working but what we did in early on in the year we noticed that quite a lot of our colleagues who did work remotely were in and around the Scot Scotland central belts region so we created a, a hub office in Edinburgh, a safe space for people for access and an, an office-like facility if they want to just get out the house. Um, so we have a great community up there. We, we um, Our senior leaders go up regularly, our, our, our managers. We run socials up there as well for those who feel a little bit disconnected from our, our great HQ here in Manchester. So we, we have a, a hub office in Edinburgh um, that, that gives that, that safety there for those who want to utilise the office space. But again, our frequent communication uh, with our weekly updates makes people feel connected um, and we have a lot of social activities that are online as well not just in the office not all evolving you know the, the, the agency point that, that Emma made around you know the, the drinking culture so we've moved away quite quite heavily from that as well so the lots of initiatives that we do um, but fundamentally it's about providing the safe space for people to work and, and access those resources as and when they want. And I also know that uh that you've also got an event yourselves on the 24th, yep. which uh, I've had because of the reason. Yep. You know, yeah, tomorrow in your new space. There you go. I promise you, I promise Nick, there'll be an advert there for you. Uh, please, please go along. You can find on event. In fact, contact Laura, I'm sure, who will be a, a highlight that thing that's happening tomorrow, I believe, at 5.30. Uh, don't get me, I, I might have got that the time wrong. 
But there you go. Um, they're doing a great event, actually, about tech and how you've become better at uh, outsourcing tech. I'd be going to it because it's their new space. And I promised people I would, but I, I don't want to give everyone the lurgy. It seems a silly time to do it. Um, I'd, I'd love to be able to go remotely. And um, just on that one as well, because um, your flock's also going to be doing an event. We're going to think it's the first, uh, first of December. So at 2 p.m., we're going to be getting, if you are thinking about all these things we talked about today, we're going to be doing an in-person event where we can all join together, have a coffee, have a bit more of an in-depth chat about all the stuff we raised today. Because I know this bit is just the first bit, really. It's just kind of getting your brains working and, and starting to learn. Now, I think, you know, if you've, I know you've all been listening, so I think you've, if you've been writing stuff down or if you're cleverer than I am and you don't need to write stuff down, you've got at least 10 or 12 different things that you can do in your agencies or you can talk to about your leadership team about what you can do in agencies. I know that about 90% of us on this call work in agencies and we are passionate at your flock to help a million people become happier at work. We can only do that by working with people like the MPA and with the people who are talking today. So for me, it's just to say an absolutely massive, huge thanks to the speakers today who I think have given us a, I mean, just a raft of different ideas that you can use, but also some depth to it that I not even contemplated. So around this kind of resilience point, which I think was a fantastic thing that Ian was saying, Emma's wisdom and, you know, rousing, absolutely right around diversity and inclusion, the absolute privilege that we have to change the world in this bit. Christian's wisdom as well is always resonant. And of course, Laura for being just wonderful and from a pad me and coming up with, as I say, I wrote down eight different things in my terrible scrawl that I try to get together. Um, we've got like one minute left and therefore I was going to say if anyone had a particular question from the audience, they can pop it into chat. Uh, but of course, we've only got one minute left. So I'm going to still say it anyway. Uh, but if it's a really big question, then, then I'm afraid that uh, we've only got like 30 seconds. Um, so that's much my fault for bad timekeeping. Has anyone got any questions? No. So everyone had a lovely time. I've had a lovely time. I hope everyone's had a lovely time. We've learned a lot, which is great. Um, as I say, please get in contact with me, Mihail Vishnevsky, who's my co-founder. Find him on LinkedIn. Um, please, please, please have a chat with him about, as I, say, I think it's we say December the 1st, 2 p.m. at our offices. We've got six people coming already. We'd like to have about 10 or 12. Come and have the same kind of conversations, but, uh, but unfortunately, not with the wisdom of the other speakers. We're going to peer-to-peer -peer network on this whole thing and really brainstorm on other stuff that we can do. Um, anyone on the chat, Mihal? I was you. Did you see any other questions? I didn't see any questions. No, that's, that's good because we literally questions. we just ran out of time. So I feel better about that because we just ran out of time. I think the speakers did a wonderful job covering pretty much everything. So I'll just end up saying a huge, huge, huge thanks to everybody. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Christian, uh, for your time and for your wisdom. Thanks everyone for coming, uh, especially some people who I know were friends of your flock and people who were. Uh, can have a chat and have a, some appointment setting with me, Hale. Uh, please do that outside of this. Uh, so huge thanks from your flock and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Wait thanks, Dan. Time. Thanks, everybody. No problem. Happy to, thank you, everyone. It's been fantastic. Thanks, Dan. Oh, wait, thanks, everyone. Still wave at the end of Zoom calls. I love that. I like that. I think people still do. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs>